Hey everyone, my name is Winnie. Welcome to my channel. I really just post anything I want to here. So there is travel stuff. If you've seen my Korea vlog from um, a couple months ago. Also makeup um, in the works and just random stuff that I feel like posting. But today I wanted to talk about some tips and tricks that I learned from visiting Korea twice now. Just as a foreigner from the US traveling to South Korea, there are some things that you might want to keep in mind just so that you can have a better experience there and just be more prepared. The first thing that I want to mention is if you already have a metro card from maybe previous visits or someone gave it to you to use, when you get to the airport and you plan on using it to take the subway, you'll need cash to load it up. And this goes for any of the subways um, that you plan to take or the buses there. You'll need cash to fill up your subway metro card so that was something i didn't know i thought i could just use my credit card and um, fill it up but we ended up having to exchange and take out some um, cash at the airport to fill up our cards so maybe i would have brought some i don't know but at the least like i would have been prepared like okay i need to take cash out when i get there so i can load my card another thing is that when you're taking cash out be careful that you might need to use cash for other things besides metro so things like food markets street food all those are mainly cash i would say korea is a pretty credit card friendly place it's just like you know the small businesses and the metro <laughs> that don't really take um, credit cards so budget accordingly took out around like 50 usd per day and i still had some like leftover another thing is don't just keep the cash what you can do is actually just load the cash up onto your metro card so if you do visit again you'll have that cash ready and you don't have to take out more to load up your metro card if you're like at the airport or something like that i made the mistake of not doing that so i just have like korean won just laying around hopefully you know i remember to bring it with me to my next trip but honestly i probably will forget so i just thought of this like after i had left i'm like oh damn i should have I should have put on my card so next time i go i can just you know have ready next if you're visiting during the summer especially during monsoon season um which i advise you not to do because it gets really humid and there's so much rain i actually bought a mini fan a portable mini fan while i was there because it was just so humid and hot and honestly that helped me a lot because i sweat a lot so i was just like wet from the rain wet from my sweat so the fan was there to just help me keep a little bit drier and cooler. Um, next, if you do plan on visiting Jeju, which I did this past trip, one of the decisions we made was to rent a car. So that was probably the smartest decision we made. There are buses and there are taxis, but as a foreigner, it's a little bit harder to navigate. So we just rented a car and we drove around the island. Before renting a car though you do need to get your international driver's permit depending on which country you're from like obviously i'm from the us we drive on the same side of the road as the south koreans do so it was really easy to just go through the process and also just drive in general the process itself is pretty simple i just went to a triple a and i needed to bring some documents i don't remember the exact documents it's you know obviously like enough id so that they can verify who you are you also need to take some photos for your international driver's permit i just took those photos there i think they were just passport photos like it was just me against a white backdrop and i paid like 30 dollars total to get the pictures and the driver's permit and the whole process only took about like 20 to 30 minutes so pretty quick in and out you just bring your idp with you and you're able to rent a car so next something to keep in mind is that if you're you know from a western country like i am people dress differently so in the us you know it's all about individuality like you wear what you want wear what you think makes you feel good so you just see a lot more of variety when it comes to like clothing whether it's more conservative or more revealing and that's totally okay here but in south korea it's pretty conservative over there um obviously i don't know politics but it's just the clothes that they wear i noticed are a lot more conservative than what we wear here in the u.s like even when it was like rainy and super hot like everyone was still pretty covered up um, like guys and girls i 
just notice that um, if you, you know, maybe don't want to get stares or you want to just like don't stand out as a tourist, just keep in mind like your clothing might make a big difference. The first time I went, I actually didn't really pay attention. But like I just wear crop tops, like shorts, like it's normal for me. But um, this time around, I kind of dressed a little bit more conservatively. And I just noticed that that's also how the rest of the country kind of dresses as well. If you are a foreigner, like I am, I noticed that a good number of shopping stores like Olive Young, I noticed that they will actually offer you a tax discount if you show them your passport. So I would say don't leave your passport at your hotel, keep it with you. Obviously keep it safe because that's super important. But um, if you go shopping, like feel free to ask them for that tax-free discount. I know that worked in a couple stores. I think like Fila, I think it worked for me. Olive Young for sure. Those are just the two that I can remember from the top of my head. Next, so during my second time in the, in the country, um, we actually got a Wi-Fi egg. And so this is just a portable Wi-Fi device. You can connect to it with your phone or any like devices that you have on you. It's super small. It's like probably the size of my palm or something like that. It looks like a portable charger, but basically you have this like portable Wi-Fi device that you can bring anywhere you go. This was super useful for the person I was traveling with. She didn't have that international data. So she just relied on the Wi-Fi to, you know, access the internet. If you have like T-Mobile or something like that, um, which I did, I actually did get like, I think like 4G or like maybe 3G LTE. So it worked, but it wasn't super fast. But having the egg was just like really nice because then we could just actually use our phones and stuff. The Wi-Fi egg in Korea is not only really useful, but it's also really affordable. We paid only like, a couple dollars every day and this was split between two people so if you have more people on your trip the price will probably go down and it's really simple to get set up all you have to do is when you land there at Incheon you can just go to the first floor we have like rows of places that sell these wi-fi eggs um, and you can just sign up there and they'll give it to you and then when you come back to Incheon to you know go home you can just return it there so really simple process um next so when you're in Korea and you're, you know, trying to navigate around or figure out where to eat, where to go, Google Maps is not the most reliable. So I used Google Maps the first time I was there and also a little bit of the second time, but it got better, but it was still like not really great. Like we ended up having to hike all the way up to Namsan Tower because Google Maps didn't lead us on the right way. What I recommend instead is to ditch the Google Maps and instead use Naver Map. So if you're thinking about, you know, choosing between Kakao or Naver, I would say go with Naver. It's deceiving on the App Store. I know me and another friend, like, we fell for this, but the Naver Map app is actually ranked a lot lower. Like, it has, like, two or three stars on um, the app store and then cacao has like five i'm pretty sure it's just because like the locals prefer cacao but naver is a lot more foreigner friendly so with cacao we tried to use it but we just saw that a lot of the directions were still in korean and i can't read korean so it was like me trying to match the characters with the signs so that took a long time but with naver we switched over because we we're like oh cacao is like way too hard for us to use so we tried out naver and most of the directions are in English. That like helped us out a ton. So we ended up just using neighbor map the entire time and it was a lot easier than using cacao. Another thing is that we found out in Korea, like people are really into reviews. So like, you know how we have like Yelp here, they actually use neighbor reviews. So if you see stuff on the map, on your neighbor map, definitely check out the reviews and see like what people say what are the ratings because those are locals like actually using the map and rating the place because google maps like it's just not really used in korea they don't use the yelp either so we're like oh my god like we don't know where to go sort of thing like what do people recommend here use neighbor this is another thing that we did a lot me and the person that i traveled with like we didn't know how to read korean so some some places their menu is going to be completely in korean so 
For times like that, with that language barrier, we use the Google Translate app. I have a feature where you can take a photo of the foreign language being displayed, and then once you take the photo, it will translate to the language that you want. We would take photos of the menu or signs, and then it would translate to English. Like sometimes it's not like 100% correct, but it was still like good enough for us to be able to like order even when there was no English on the menu. Especially in places like Jeju, we had to use the app a lot more because it's just like more local and it's like small town there. But in Seoul, we didn't use it as much because it's more of a city and they had like more people who spoke like a little bit of English and we were able to like get by. And last but not least, if you know this is your first time traveling abroad or you're not used to traveling abroad, look up the power voltage for you know whatever country that you're going to. So in this case, like talking about Korea, their power voltage was different from the US standard. So um, before going, I purchased a power converter so that I could, you know, bring my electronic devices and still be able to plug them in, but through the converter instead. Otherwise, like, you know, if you didn't have that converter, you wouldn't be able to plug it in or use it. So I think a lot of convenience stores will sell this converter, but it just, I don't know, made more sense for me to bring it overseas so that I wouldn't have to be limited to what was available in the convenience store. So I just got mine on Amazon. A lot of other countries will use the same converter. It's not like a one-time use sort of thing. I'm pretty sure I'll use it again in another trip. Those are my tips and tricks slash what I learned from prepping and going to Korea this past year in 2023. I hope this helped some of you. A lot of these questions I ended up like, I was searching on Reddit. There's a lot of good information there as some of you might know. A lot of that information you have to like sift through you have to like look at the comments like ask specific questions so i just wanted to kind of just consolidate it in this video let you know so you have a better and easier time packing and um just having your trip in korea